Well, welcome to week three of our series called The Lifeguard. How many are glad to be in God's house tonight? It's great to see you all here. Now, this uh, coming Saturday, I'm preaching at the Church of God State uh, Conference, and um, it really fits into our vision because we're trying to really see Arizona get turned on for Jesus, and we need all the Church of God churches to be on fire for God. So you pray for me this Saturday as I preach at this conference, but what I'm going to do tonight is I want to preach to you the message I'm going to preach to these leaders, because every one of you are leaders, and every one of you has influence. So I'm going to preach this lifeguard message to you. I hope you'll be challenged and stretched uh, here tonight. So 1987, thanks, buddy, appreciate that. 1987 was a great year for me. I graduated high school, Scottsdale Christian Academy Eagles, and uh, I started dating this amazing, beautiful woman. She turned my world upside down. She was so beautiful. She was almost like an angel. In fact, when I turned the radio on, everywhere I went, I, I, just, I just heard angel all the time. Songs like this. Earth angel, earth angel. Oh, that just mine. touched my heart. Angel was on my mind all the time. I get back in the car, turn the radio on, hear a song like this. I just couldn't get this woman off my mind. I'd get back in the car, turn around, I'd hear this song. And then, and then I go back home and turn the television on and hear songs like this. Some of you are thinking about those poor puppy dogs right now in that commercial, I know. I want you to know there was a, a season in my life, and it's, I'm still in that season, where I had angel on the mind all the time. You, you can tell a lot about a person by what's always on their mind. Uh, some parents, when they first have that first child, the child's always on their mind. I mean, it could be 2 a.m. and a lizard will scurry across the backyard, and they're up. Is a baby okay? Because that baby is always on their mind. Some marketplace people always have business on their mind. It's business, business, business. It's always on their mind. They'll ask me to go to lunch, and the whole time they're looking at their cell phone under the table. I'm like, dude, I'm right here. You wanted to have lunch. But the truth is, they got business on their mind all the time. Um, some, you know, some people have acquisitions on their mind all the time. What else can I buy? What else can I acquire? They always have acquisition on the mind. I'll say it again. You can tell a whole lot about a person by what's always on their mind, which leads me to the question that you probably knew I was going to ask. Who or what is on your mind these days? Who or what is mostly on your mind these days? Now, I could create a panic here tonight by saying that we now have the technology to put what's on your mind right now on the video screens behind me. And we do have that technology, so go ahead. No, just kidding. We don't have that technology. I wish we did. We don't. But if Jesus were standing here tonight in the flesh and blood, and we asked him what preoccupies your mind, he would not say a romantic interest or business gains or money or fame. He'd say one word. People. I got people on my mind. Lost people and found people. Young people and older people, rich people and poor people, sought after people and forgotten people, people of every race and ethnicity. Never did any person ever display a greater preoccupation with people than Jesus did. When Jesus called a few men to be his disciples, he said, guys, up until this point, what mostly has preoccupied your mind has been fish, right? Nothing wrong with the fishing business. You got to make a living. But from here on out, I'm going to ask you to be part of a grander vision, a more eternal vision. We're not going to just fish for fish anymore. We're going to fish for people. And from the very first day of his discipleship training school, Jesus sought to establish the priority of people in the minds of his followers. And I want to say it was a very tough sell. 
Do you remember how many times the disciples would put something else in front of the value of people, be it their schedules or petty personal differences, status or power? And do you recall how often Jesus would have to call a timeout and rearrange the value furniture again in the room just to remind them that the most precious and important commodity in the eyes of God is people. That we are to be people who live our lives with people on our minds. Jesus modeled this value all throughout his life and his ministry. When he was facing the torment on the cross, his executioners threw him on the ground and started pounding nails into his hands and his feet. If, if that were me, I'd be seething with vengefulness, but not Jesus. Jesus looks up to heaven and says, Father, would you forgive these guys? They don't know what they're doing. He's got the executioners on his mind. And then after hanging on the cross for hours, Jesus looks down and sees his mother and he points to John, he says, Mom, this man is now your son. And John, I want you to take care of my mama. He's got people on his mind. And then when he was within seconds of breathing his last breath, a criminal on his side starts trash talking him while the other one cries out for forgiveness. And Jesus uses his dying breaths to offer grace and forgiveness for, for this repentant thief. He's got people on his mind. Never has anyone ever displayed a greater preoccupation with people than Jesus did, which should prompt all of us who call ourselves follower of, followers of Jesus to ask ourselves a question, why is that? What enabled Jesus to stay so focused on people despite all the pressures and hardships in and around his life? Well, allow me to mention just three possible explanations for why Jesus was able to live his life always with people on his mind. First of all, maybe, just maybe, Jesus was able to live his life with people on his mind because Jesus knew his Father's heart better than anyone else ever had. You see, every time Jesus sensed that someone was putting a higher value on something other than people, he'd say, you guys obviously don't know my Father's heart very well. Because if you did know my father's heart well, you would never put that thing in front of the value of people. So at one time, Jesus and his disciples were refused passage through a certain part of Samaria. And it was gonna lengthen their journey substantially because in those days you had to walk around and it was gonna add like six or seven miles to their daily journey, it was a big deal. And so these disciples were so ticked off at this group of people, these Samarit Samaritans, that this is what they say to Jesus in Luke chapter nine. Jesus, call down fire from heaven and destroy these dogs. And Jesus is like, wow, dogs, really? Wow, you guys obviously don't know my father's heart very well. Because if you really knew my father's heart, you would never, you would know he would never put a higher value on, on, on the pride of, uh, the wounded pride of 12 Jews, more so than he would on the redemption of these Samaritans. Another time, some Pharisees were trying to find fault with Jesus, and they saw Jesus hanging out with the wrong crowd. These were religious leaders, and they saw Jesus. They were trying to trap Jesus. And they said, how can you, who claim to be God's son, hang out with this riffraff, these awful people, people that were coloring outside the lines, using foul language, getting drunk every night, sleeping in the wrong beds, you all know the type. And Jesus was hanging out with these folks. He liked to hang out with them, in fact. And Jesus turns to these religious people and he says, you know, it's amazing. With all your theological degrees and robes and tassels, you really don't have a clue as to what the Father's heart really is all about. How he really feels about people who are still far from him. And then Jesus goes on and tells these three amazing stories. The story of a lost sheep, the story of a lost coin, and the story of a lost wayward son. There's, there's a, a, a one lost sheep that gets lost, stupid sheep just wanders off, and the shepherd leaves the 99, and he scours the mountainside till he finds the one lost sheep, and he scoops him up and brings him back to the fold. Then there's this widow who loses one coin, probably represents half of her net worth. 
And she turns her house upside down. She turns furniture over. And when she finally finds the lost coin, she calls a party, a celebration, because that which was lost was now found. And this last story is really close to home. It's about a wayward lost son. The son goes out and squanders his father's inheritance even before his father dies. And when he spends all that money, he comes back. And when the father sees his son coming back after many years, he puts a, a golden ring on his finger and wraps him in a royal robe and says, my lost son has finally come home. And this passage ends in Luke 15 where Jesus says, nothing matters. Nothing matters as much to the Father as reclaiming even just one human being. Just one. He has a heart for them. What we have to understand is we are lifeguards. We are the hands and we are the feet of Jesus. Jesus has no plan B on how to reach your neighbors, how to reach people in our world. We are it. If we don't do it, it's not going to get done. We are his plan A. And we are to be lifeguards. We are to be in search mode. Search mode for people who yet have come to know the Father. Yeah. You all know what search mode is, right? I got to tell you my story. When I was uh, 10 years old, my brother Matthew was four years old. My dad took our family to Los Angeles for the first time. We lived way back in Davenport, Iowa. We lived in cornfields, you know, small little city. We had no idea. I, I always wanted to see the ocean. I wanted to see the Pacific Ocean. So he took us to L.A., and then we got to our hotel right near the ocean. And my dad said, come on, boys, get your swimsuit on. So me and Matthew and my dad, we ran down to the beach. And this particular day, there was, you know, a strong uh, riptide, and the caution flags were up. The wind was blowing, and they said, be careful. But we didn't care. We just threw caution to the wind and stormed right into that water, and we're just playing around. There's hundreds of people in the water with us. And we're having a great time. All of a sudden, my dad turns around, and, and Matthew, our four-year-old, is gone. We can't find him. And, and I watched my dad, Matthew? 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 We can't find Matthew. We thought maybe a, the riptide sucked him out to sea, or maybe a shark came by and took him out to sea. And I watched the intensity in my dad's eyes grow more fervent, all of a sudden he's yelling at the top of his voice, Matthew, Matthew, and veins are bulging out of his, out of his neck, and he, he's causing a scene. Soon the whole beach is, is looking for this little lost boy. I, I, I'll never forget the intensity of a, of a father who lost his son going after his son. Pretty soon we got a radio call in from a lifeguard station that was down, you know how they are every several hundred yards and we found this little boy floating down here. We pulled him out, and my dad had heard that. He started sprinting. I've never seen anything like it. Sprinting down to that lifeguard station. And when he saw Matthew there, Matthew got up, and my dad ran and wrapped his arms around Matthew. And he said, oh, son, let's not be telling your mother about this, you know. <laughs> There's certain things that father and son need to keep between them. <clears throat> you know what I mean, son? But I had an illustrated sermon on that day about how a father really feels about a son. And it was a picture of how our great God is in search mode, going after every person that still has not yet met the father. And because Jesus knew his father's heart toward people, it created in him an attitude of radical inclusivity. Wherever Jesus went, he extended a kind of irrational acceptance for all people. He just kept saying, come as you are. I want you in my kingdom. Come exactly as you are. The kingdom is wide open to you. No one has ever had arms as wide open as Jesus. And I think it's because he understood the Father's heart for people more than anybody else ever had. And by the way, friends, the more we really get to know God through his son Jesus, the more our own arms will open up. And the more radically inclusive we will be to people who are still far from God. Secondly, Maybe another reason why Jesus always had people on his mind is because Jesus understood eternal realities better than anybody else ever had. Now, you know this. We live in the instamatic age. We live in the age of 24-hour news cycles. We live in the smartphone age. You can pull up any information you want in just seconds 
on your smart, smartphone. We live in the age where you put a bag of popcorn in the microwave and push a button, and you're like, this is taking forever, right? You know, we live in the here and now. Forget about the now and then generation. But a, a good portion of Jesus' teaching was set against the backdrop of these impending eternal realities. Jesus, being eternal, had a stranglehold grip on the nature of time. And he would often remind people while he was teaching that, number one, they have a shelf life, that their days are numbered, and number two, that nothing makes it from this world into the next world except people. Not land, not titles, not achievements, none of that stuff pierces the veil. Only people do. Only people live for eternity. Which is why Jesus made statements like he did in Mark chapter 8 where he said, what should it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Jesus says, just do the math on this, friends. You wouldn't want to gain the whole world for 80 years and then lose your soul for billions and billions and billions of years in hell. It doesn't make any sense. Or his words from the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6 where he says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on this earth where moth and, and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in where? In heaven. And people ask, well, Jesus, what would treasures in heaven look like? And he'd say, people, just people. Nothing else is going to make it into the next reality except for people. And because Jesus lived with this kind of eternal perspective, he went about his daily business with a kind of focused urgency on people. Not, not a weird, wild-eyed, anxiety-filled urgency. Just a purposeful, people-centered kind of urgency that would cause him to tr change his travel plans to meet and to heal a troubled person. The kind of urgency that would, that would cause him to confront a wealthy young ruler about the condition of his soul rather than be impressed by his net worth. The kind of urgency that would, that would challenge him to send his disciples out to witness in a hostile world, knowing that it might not go very well for them. He said one time, I'm sending you out like sheep among the wolves. Your ministry is going to be excruciatingly difficult and demanding, and sometimes it's going to feel very defeating. But the upside of this whole thing is this possibility that just one more person, one more treasure is going to come to know the Father. And I promise you this, he said, it'll be worth it to you one day. It'll be worth it to you that you kept your eye on the real treasure. You kept people on your mind. Jesus would have loved the series we're doing called The Lifeguard. You know why? Because it's all about the very thing that's on his mind and heart, which is people. We're talking about the very thing that's the closest to the heart of God. And that's why his final challenge to his followers was go into all this world and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Spread the love of Christ. Take huge risks when you leave this place. Tell people in your world, in your, in your circle of love, that God has a great destiny for them. Never has anyone ever displayed a greater preoccupation with people than Jesus did. He lived his whole life, 33 years, with people on his mind. Got time for one more here tonight? Perhaps another reason why Jesus was able to live with people on his mind is because Jesus was able to see the potential in people better than anybody, anyone else ever had. You know, great entrepreneurs have this ability to see the hidden potential in a product before anybody else does. And because of their vision and insight in that product's potential, they build the great startup companies of our day. Great athletic coaches are able to see the hidden potential in a high school athlete. And because they can see the potential in that athlete, they grow the great sports dynasties of our day. Jesus had this uncanny ability to look past all the obvious muck and mire in people's lives and just visualize who they might become if the power of God were ever released in them, then he'd seek to draw that potential out of them. I mean, who else could have envisioned a hidden philanthropist in the life of Zacchaeus, a crooked tax collector? Who could have envisioned a, a brave church planner hiding out in a cowardly fisherman named Peter? Who could have seen and envisioned a godly worshiping woman currently dressed up as a lady of the evening 
and probably working that very night. Friends, look at me. Jesus, the one that we serve, he just looked at people differently. He looked at people differently. He never got bogged down by the current simple reality of their lives. He just kept saying, with God, all things are possible. He just kept looking at people with this this irrepressible kind of optimism and saying things like the old can become new and the fallen can be restored. Come on, somebody. And wanderers can come home and derelicts can become disciples. He just kept believing in the power of God to transform human lives. He said, you can change, man. You can change, man. You can change, but God, all things are possible. Now, I'm sure there are many other reasons why Jesus was able to live with people in his mind. But I want to remind all of us tonight, as we just kind of target this down to our hearts now, of a very important spiritual formation principle. I want you to grab a hold of this tonight. Paul says it like this, the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, 29. He says, for those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, Jesus. I'm going to read it again. What does that mean? For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed, to be changed to the image of his son, Jesus. What that means is that the goal of every person that's right with God, the goal ought to be for God to transform us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ, right? That we're supposed to be becoming more like Jesus every day. In other words, if you will just cooperate with the work of the Holy Spirit in your life, you will become like Jesus. If you're faithful to the house of God, you read God's word, you pray, you share your faith, slowly over time, you will become more like Jesus. You will be transformed. So in the context of what I just taught you for the last 15, 20 minutes, I think this would mean that three things would naturally start to happen in your life, in my life, over time. First of all, wouldn't it be true that as we come to know the Father's heart more deeply, that we would start to develop the same kind of radical inclusivity toward people outside of the church that people, that, that Jesus manifested? What would happen here at Dream City if all of us would become so familiar with the Father's heart like Jesus and so conformed to the image of Jesus Christ that we'd walk around every single day with people on our mind? Can you imagine if carpenters and painters and real estate brokers and airline pilots and lawyers and homemakers believed to the core of their being, I'm really, I'm actually in the people business. I might swing a hammer during the daytime. I might trade stocks. I might homeschool my kids. I might get my paycheck from XYZ Corporation. But my fundamental mission in this life is to be a radically inclusive Christ follower, someone who shares the heart of lost people For people so deeply that I I just live my life with people on my mind all the time. I mean, wouldn't it be incredible if we could just be so conformed to the image of Jesus that we'd walk out of this place tonight and live our lives with people on the mind, always asking, who might I help today? Who might I serve today? Who might I point to my father? Who might I bring to church in hopes I can partner with my church in seeing them come to know Jesus? People on our minds. Secondly, maybe it would also be true that as we're being conformed in the image of Jesus Christ, that we would also begin to share Jesus' sense of urgency about these impending eternal realities. I think you know this, but my dad is my hero. I've never seen a man more passionate about winning souls, and, and uh, this weekend he's going to be preaching here. I hope you all will bring someone who's far from God They'll be saved if they're here. I believe that. How many believe if you bring someone, there's a high likelihood they will be saved this weekend? But we got to bring them. We got to bring them. My dad will be 84 in October. I know that surprised you. He looks like he's about 40 years old. Um, when, I, when he was coming back from his heart surgery, um, he hadn't been to his local Starbucks in about eight months. And so he and I, I was doing all the duties of the church because he was down for eight months. And he was still a senior pastor, but I was carrying the load. I guess it was pr- pretty heavy on me. And she went to Starbucks. And the barista, she, she says to us, she says, are you two brothers? And my dad felt so good about that. 
And I felt so bad about that. Like, man, the ministry's been hard on me, man. But he's 84 years old. And this week, uh, his new book, many of you haven't bought his new book, it's called What If? It's a biography on his whole life and ministry. And it'll be here this weekend. You, you can buy that book. He'll sign it for you. It's going to be wonderful. He's preaching this weekend here, as I said. But you know, my dad, growing up, he had some pretty crazy, bizarre ways of getting people to come to the house of God. He believed in big days and all these hooks to get people to come to church to hear the gospel message. One day he said, we're gonna build the largest, we're gonna set the Guinness Book of World Record. This is back in Iowa where he pastored. I'm like eight years old. The Guinness Book of World Record for the largest popsicle ever built. So the people in the church were all, you know, all excited about this. But then my dad thought, how am I gonna do this? I have no plan for this. So he went down and found like a, 5,000 gallon drum, big, big round drum. And then he went down to a, 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 a warehouse where they had these big freezers. And they poured about six inches of orange juice in the bottom and then froze that. And they poured about six inches of grape juice on top of that in different flavors all the way up. It's about this tall. And they put two, two, two by fours on the top of it. And they thought, how am I gonna get this thing to church, right? <laughs> So they, they found a crane to take it to church, and they had the world's largest popsicle. People came from all over the valley. They brought their friends. They brought their loved ones who were far from God. They thought they were coming to see a, a popsicle, but they're actually coming to hear a gospel message. He used that as a hook. You see, we believe that the method is not sacred. The message is what's sacred. And Jesus used all kinds of methods when he taught. Then one day he said, we're going to set another Guinness Book of World Records. A few of these are still in the Guinness Book of World Records. We are going to build the largest um, banana split. And so what they did is they got all these rain gutters, hundreds and hundreds of yards of rain gutters. And uh, they encouraged all the members to bring, how many will bring, a, you know, a gallon of ice cream? Okay, 500 people will bring a gallon of ice cream. How many, how many, how many will bring whipped cream? Okay. And, and they all showed up. And... The kids came, they had 40 buses, busing kids all in from all over that Davenport area. About 2,000 kids that would bus in every weekend to hear the gospel message. And so while they're in children's church, the volunteers were outside and scooping ice cream, putting it in the gutter, scooping ice cream, putting it in the gutter, you know, and they had it all done, but service went a little bit long that day and it all began to melt together. So these kids, they ran out there, and they, it was like pigs slopping, you know. They went to this gutter, and it all run together. There, there were no dividers. It was just like soup, and they were just having a big day, you know, a big time. But he was, he was pretty radical in the way that he chose to reach out and try to get people to the house of God. And then when we came to Phoenix, Arizona, we had the world's largest Easter egg hunt. We rented every single high school football stadium in Phoenix. Pastor Dale Lane was the... Where's Pastor Dale? Was a bus pastor. 40 to 50,000 kids filling stadiums all over on Easter Sunday. Then they had a big Easter egg hunt. And they had this great idea that they're going to have these golden eggs. And in the golden eggs, they could pop them open. There'd be a, a coupon in there. And whoever found the golden egg would get a special prize. And the special prize was baby chicks for pets. And so they gave out just dozens of these baby chicks, and PETA found out about it. And PETA called my dad, how dare you, how dare you give away those precious little chicks? Those kids don't know how to care for them. How dare you? My dad said, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I'll never do it again. But then he said, I have a confession to make to you. I ate the baby chick's mama. My dad, it's a good thing he's not pastoring today in this politically correct society. I mean, uh, <laughs> one time we were having Father's Day. Last week was Father's Day here, and we have Sock It to Dad Sunday. We used to hand out socks for presents. To my, my dad always said that what pastors need is socks, you know, because the boys always take their socks. I guess it was from, from personal, you know, illustration there. And uh, so... He, um, he uh, was trying to find out who the, the father was who had the most children. So he said, you have five children or more, stand to your feet, and a bunch stand up. And there's six or more remain standing, seven or more remain standing. Finally, there's one guy on the balcony up here, and he just 
was still standing. So your brother, come down here. You win. And he got the, you know, on the video screens and all this. This brother runs down there. And my dad goes, happy Father's Day. How many, how many kids do you have, pa brother? And he said, pastor, I got 19 daughters. But you know, my daddy is always thinking about his next line, you know. And he, he thought about, he's got this shtick about Solomon and his wives, you know, 700 wives. He always says, that's a lot of pantyhose hanging across the shower bar. Everybody laughs about that. And so when the guy says 19 daughters, that's, what, what, that's what's in his mind. And all he says is, brother, that's a lot of hoes in the bathroom. <laughs> and there's this nervous laughter all throughout the crowd. He has no idea what he said. He's just reading his story, you know. But I want to tell you, there, there, was, an, there was an era at this church. Someone just now got that back there. All right. God bless you, buddy. There, there was an era. Listen now. There was an era at this church where every person sitting in these seats, they really live their lives with people in their mind all the time and would use these big days for people to invite their friends and loved ones and family who were still far from God. So when my dad was in Davenport, Iowa, he was the largest, he was the largest uh, Charismatic church, broke all the records for growth, even beat all the Baptists that year, which is a big deal. And um, he was written up in every magazine. And uh, my dad <clears throat> asked Johnny, was preaching one day, and Johnny Cash was in the audience, and my dad built a relationship with him and asked him to come to a big, big concert at John O'Donnell Stadium in Davenport, Iowa. And Johnny Cash's heart had been touched by Jesus, and he came free of charge for his whole band and dad said, you'll sing your songs and I'll preach the gospel, we'll have a great crusade. And thousands of people came to know Jesus. Johnny Cash was so impressed with, with my dad's heart for lost people that some of you don't know this, but he actually wrote a song about my dad. Now, I didn't even know this for the first 40 years of my life. If Johnny Cash wrote a song about me, I'd be telling my kids, you know, very early, but he didn't even tell me about this. I had to find out through somebody else. But Johnny Cash actually wrote a song about my dad. You'd like to hear it? Go ahead and play it. Cause the devil is after the great super preachers. You try to discredit the gospel they bring. But Billy and Rex and Oral and Bob hold to their commitment to Jesus the King. Oh, Billy Sunday is dead and gone. Young Tommy Barnett is coming. How about that, huh? Young Tommy Barnett is coming on strong. I love that. I tell you, people stood up and took notice of a man who lived his life with people on his mind. You know, some people ask, well, why, do we, why do we do things like the Dream Center? Reaching out to people, rescuing people that a lot of churches really don't have any use for. Because Jesus told us to have people in our mind, to see the goal, to see the hidden potential in every life. Why do we do things like the Colorado City Dream Center, going into a town of fundamental, Mor fundamental Mormonism, polygamy, and trying to plant a church and trying to rescue young, young ladies from polygamy? Because those people matter to Jesus. And if they matter to Jesus, they ought to matter to us. Why are we starting a White Mountains Dream Center this August, launching it specifically geared for Native American people and their needs? It's because they matter to Jesus. They need to matter to a church as well. Why do we have Thrive Ministry that, that reaches out to those kids who are in foster care, who have lost their way, trying to give them a second chance of life because they matter to Jesus? Why do we do JC Supercars? You guys donate your cars to the church. We give them to single moms in the church. Because people matter to Jesus. I could go on, but I, this is what I want to say. We, we kind of got to get back to that day where every single one of us lives with that passion and that fervency where we live every single day with people in our minds. Can you say amen to that? And then third and last, we're almost done. I'm just taking a little more liberty tonight telling all these stories. Are you having a good time tonight? One more thing, and then I'll challenge you. It's in prayer. Wouldn't it be amazing if all of us here tonight 
could just get down on our knees and just say, God, would you just conform me in the image of your son Jesus in such a way that I would begin to see the hidden potential in people and begin to see the potential the way that God sees them. That we would just be, be able to look beyond the current muck of someone's life and visualize who they might become if Jesus Christ were at the center of their lives. Now, I'm going to be very open and honest right now. It is so easy to lose hope in people, isn't it? It's so easy to become so annoyed by certain people that you actually don't wish them well at all. You just wish it kind of just go away. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, right, right now the Phoenix Suns are thriving. They're they're up 2-0 on the, two on the Lakers, but when, when I mean, on the Clippers. But when they were playing the, uh, the Lakers, I feel like my dad feels about the Lakers. I would rather pull for the Taliban than I would the Lakers. I did, I'm sorry, I just got to say that. I just despise the Lakers. I despise LeBron James and, or LeCon, I mean, um, LeFraud James. No, I'm sorry. Uh, and I, I, when I was watching the game, I got so mad at LeBron James, I called my dad and said, Dad, I'm so mad at him right now. I just wish one of the Phoenix Suns would reach up and try to block the shot and just decapitate him right now. <laughs> and Dad, I feel bad. I'm pretty sure that's not Jesus' way, you know. But you all know what I'm talking about. It's the CNN news anchor that gets under your skin. It's the neighbor that you hope you don't run into. It's the family member at gatherings when they walk in like, ugh, him, ugh, her. It's people with different political beliefs or morality beliefs that we wish would just kind of move off the island. And truth be told, there's probably someone in your world right now that you used to have great hope for finding Jesus. You, you prayed for them. They were on your prayer list. But maybe now you've taken them off your list because you've reasoned they're just not going to change. It's never going to happen. Friends, Jesus never let that defeatist attitude rule in his mind and heart. He just kept saying with optimism, all things are possible. Fred can change and Diane can change and Peter can change. With God, all things are possible. What would happen in our church if we all asked God to grow our hearts and give us eyes like Jesus' eyes? To look beyond all that annoying muck that we see sometimes and imagine what they would be like if Jesus Christ were at the center of their life. And with great vision and faith, we would not lose hope. We would say all things are possible. Every life can change. Even that guy's life can change. Even that lady's heart can change. Let's pray. Let's sow some seed. Let's believe. Let's, let's reach out. Let's see what God might do. No matter how dark things get in our culture, we can never lose hope that people can change. Because when a church loses hope, it's game over. It's lights out. We can never lose hope. Can you say amen? If there was ever a reason for a young man to lose hope, it happened in Bangladesh in the year 1995. Angel and I were asked to go to Bangladesh to do a, a church conference there. Let me tell you about Bangladesh. At that time, right now, a population of 140 million people, 90% Muslim, less than 1% Christian. At that time, in 1995, it was 600,000 Christians in the entire nation. It's illegal to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ in Bangladesh. And if you're caught baptizing someone in the name of Jesus in Bangladesh, you'll be put to death. So this young missionary had gathered the nation's top Christian leaders in his home, and we're going to talk to them, share strategy with them. And this young leader began to share a vision and dream of how to see 600 new conversions to Christ over the next 10 years. Now, I'm listening to all this, and there is nothing to give the average person any hope to believe that this could ever happen. It's illegal to preach Jesus in Bangladesh. But this young leader stood up before all these little village pastors in his home. He said, I believe if we can just share the dream with all of our pastors and the Holy Spirit really begins to move and they can grasp the Father's heart and understand eternal realities and be urgent about reaching people and, and see the, pe the potential in people, I believe we can see another 600,000 people come to Jesus in the next 10 years. And all these little vision, 
uh, these little village pastors stood up and began to cheer and clap and praise God. They bought it. They believed it. I'm sitting there thinking, they're buying this. They're drinking the Kool-Aid. They actually believe this can happen. And then I thought to myself, you know, Jesus, he would love this vision. Because it's all about people. It's urgent. It's bold. It requires faith and courage. Jesus would love this vision. In fact, Jesus loves visions like this so much that he spilled every drop of his blood to make them possible. Jesus is all in for visions like this. He's vested. He bled for it. I checked the local stats today. Today there's not 600,000 Christians in Bangladesh. There's one point eight million Christians in the nation of Bangladesh. The reality and the power of that young pastor really spoke to me. If that young pastor can stand up with boldness and courage and challenge his people to reach their nation, then how much more should I be standing up for our church and challenging the people of our church to say, we can do more. We can reach the state of Arizona with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We can rescue this state. We can reach this nation with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we can just get people like you all fired up for Jesus, and if we can understand the heart of the Father for people who are different than us and outside these walls is massive, it's huge, and if we can have that heart, and if we can understand these impending eternal realities and realize that people are dying every single day and going into hell without Jesus. And if we can just look beyond the annoying muck that we see on television and on the streets and all that's happening and see the potential of what they might become. Why wouldn't we then go? Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Why wouldn't we go? So this is what I want to say to you today. We're done. I thought about how I challenged you tonight. And this is what I want to say to you as your pastor. I'm going. Okay? I'm going. I wish that all of you would go with me. But if you don't go with me, then what is my response to be as a private follower of Jesus Christ? Though none go with me, I still need to follow. And that needs to be your position. I'm going, Pastor Luke, and though no go, none go with me, I'm still going because this job has to get done. So here's the way I thought we'd end this message tonight. Some of you just need to drive a stake in the ground. You need a staple of what this night really has meant to you. We're not living here ignorant tonight. We're living here informed people of what Jesus wants us to do and be. So this is what I thought. Sometimes in life, you need those, those little snapshots, those little pictures to remind you of what God did in your life. So I thought it'd be cool if you all stand to our feet. Would you stand with me? I thought it'd be really cool if one by one tonight, you got your cell phone out and you walked up on the stage and and you took a picture of what you really are. You're salt of the earth. If we don't do the job, the job is not gonna get done. So I thought it'd be cool if all of us tonight, one by one, it might take a little while, walk up here and we'll help you up here and just sit in this chair. I'm glad our HR manager's not here tonight, our risk manager, he would have a heart attack right now. Atwood, if you're watching online, just turn it off right now, don't watch anything else, all right, because this is going to give you hives, I promise you right now. I think it'd be cool if you'd come here and have your spouse just snap a picture of you and just remind you, put this on your desk somewhere to remind you of what you are. Jesus says you're salt. You're the salt of the earth, so am I. And some of us tonight need to grit our teeth and drive a stake in the ground and say, though none go with me, I will follow. I want the heart of Jesus. So, Father, I pray tonight that you would let your heart, you would let this word go deep into our hearts. We want the heart of the Father. We, we know we can't be salt on our own. We just need a, a change in priority, a change in focus. 
And these are the remnant people who come on Wednesday nights. These are the people who are really devout in their faith and they want to make a difference. And you brought them here tonight to create a sense of urgency in their heart, to remind them that their life is so important. It's more important than their business. It's more important than their hobbies. The most important thing that we can do in life is to be salt and light to this world. So Father, I pray as we conclude this service tonight that there just be a, a heart transformation that takes place in each of our hearts. Your Apostle Paul said, Lord, that we will be transformed in the image of your son, Jesus. Let that transformation happen tonight. Let this church just explode this weekend with new life and new people who, are, who have yet to meet the Father. And as we pull the net in this weekend, there'll be a mighty harvest of people who are once bound on their way to hell but now they're on their way to heaven. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your people. And we move forward. We go with great excitement for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you receive this word tonight? Okay, well, here's how we're gonna end. You got nothing better to do tonight. The Eastern Conference Finals, who cares about that? Because the Suns are gonna be who are in the Eastern Conference Finals. I wanna encourage you to make your way on this platform. We, help, we need some guys to help. Arian, you guys come and help these people up here. Take a picture of yourself. Get it developed. Put in a frame and remind yourself, this was my night. We love you guys. Be blessed. Have a wonderful week.